It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Leon and Patricia Rucker. We're here in Toronto and it's just before Shabbos, but I'm so grateful to you that um, I have the opportunity to meet with you and to hear your amazing story. So Leon, if you could mention about it, your family, your okay, origins. Yes, uh, my name is Leon Rucker. I was born in France. July 20th, 1937. My parents were immigrants to France from Galicia. Uh, my father was a furrier. And um, anyway, we were living in, uh, in Paris. But then, of course, the war broke out. And um, the, eventually, the uh, French army capitulated and the uh, Germans came to Paris. And at the same time, the, there was a government crisis and the person who took over the government was a well-known figure called Maréchal Pétain. And he was uh, a man of the extreme right. And he was one of those who felt that all the problems of France he, uh, were to some extent due to foreigners and in particular Jews. So after he took over, he uh, instituted a whole series of uh, laws against the Jews, and in particular of foreign Jews, Jews who were not born in France, like my parents. I was born in France, but my parents came from a part of Eastern Europe called Galicia. Okay, and Patricia, you have a picture? This is, should I say? Yeah. yeah this, <clears throat> this is uh, the organization of young progressive Jews in the town of Ravaruska, which is uh, now on the border of Poland and Ukraine. At the time it was part of Poland. And Leon's parents, Nathan and Leah, were members of a youth group called Gordonia. And this is, this is the group and there they are as a young couple, before they emigrated to France. And what made them decide to go to France? Oh, economic reason, better opportunity. Uh, you know, it was like some people went to America, okay, they went to France. Did they have family in France? No. Oh, well, sorry, I'm sorry. My father already had his sister and her family living in France. Okay, so this is what uh, encouraged them to come to come to Paris. And were you the firstborn? I was an only child for how, how long? When was it? For maybe 15, 16 years. <laughs> one, one pre-war, one post-war. Wow. So Leon, can I just ask you? Okay, so what happened when when the government changed and um, and an and anti-Jewish? Um yes, the uh, after the uh, French army was defeated in 1940, in June 1940, uh, the French Assembly installed a very respected figure from the First World War, Maréchal Pétain who uh, essentially dissolved the republic and started a very authoritarian type of government, very much the more like Mussolini or something like that, which is called l'État français, the French state. And um, this government started a whole series of edicts that uh, Jews, especially foreign Jews like my parents, should be put in uh, in holding camps. Like they were not concentration camps, but in holding camps. But anyway, my parents then decided to move to the French Riviera. There's a city called Nice on the French Riviera that uh, were the, <laughs> the, really the foundation of the economy of Nice were the British tourists that used to come there in the winter time to escape the bad <laughs> English weather. So then after the war, no more British tourists. So the local authorities said that if the Jews arrive in Nice, they will not be 
bothered. They will be left left alone. So my father first went to, to Nice. Um, it was a bit difficult because he had to cross a particular line which separated the north from the south and he was put in a jail, but the Germans, but anyway, one of the German soldiers let him escape. And once he escaped, he got on a train, got to Nice, and he sent papers to my mother's that he had now established residence in Nice. And so we were able to go across this line between the north and the south, and we went to Nice. And there the authorities were true to their words, and the population of Jews in Nice grew to maybe 20, 30,000 uh, because of that. And, you know, we were essentially uh, left, left alone, and my parents used whatever money they had brought from Paris to sort of continue uh, living in Nice. Here is a picture of Leon's mother and Leon together with some of their friends on the promenade in Nice. Yeah, this one. <coughs> you see, in Nice there is a, we could there's a very <coughs> nice avenue along the sea, seaside called Promenade des Anglais because the English, the English used to come there. Okay. So the Jews would sort of walk up and down the Promenade des Anglais. <laughs> when just a little. <coughs> uh, and okay, that's who's in the picture? Maybe yeah. have. But you know, I mean, I have an electronic version of this book. Oh, this is wonderful. Know. This is, Leon, are you in the, are you, who is in the picture, uh, the little book? Uh, this is his mother and there is Leon. Gee, He's a little Leon, boy you, friend This is amazing. And the, what year was this picture taken? That because would have been, I'd say, 1940, 41, something. 41, like 42. And your father, is he in the picture as well? Uh, no, he's not. But your mother is. She's yeah. on, the, on the right. On the, on the, on the, on the, when you're looking at it, yeah. yes, the far right. And there you, Leon, so cute. Wow. <clears throat> So um, it didn't. They didn't feel the war. It didn't really affect so much in the very beginning. At the very beginning, no, because as I said, the authorities in Nice said that if the Jews come, to, in effect, to replace the British tourists, they were no longer there. That was the uh, you know to support the economy. Um, however, let me see the. the uh, Anyway, at the time there was war and uh, the, the Germans were bombing Great Britain and um, you see what, what... Well, then the Italians left. Yes, what happened is that once the Allies landed in Italy, the Italian army, they just took off, they went. And so they were replaced by the Germans who then moved into the southern, southern zone. But by then, my parents had moved to a much larger city called Lyon, okay, where they had friends that would protect them. And also, in the meantime, we had gone to visit my aunt and uncle, who had found refuge in a very tiny village in the center of France called Nere. And so we came to visit them. And there, when we visited them, we became acquainted with a French farm family called Langlois who definitely were not supporters of Pétain or Vichy or anything like that. So my parents knew that eventually they would have to go into hiding, but how do you hide with a five-year-old child? So they communicated with this Langlois family, and one of their daughters, Suzanne Langlois, came to Nice to pick me up, and uh, she took me to that village, and I stayed with them literally until the liberation. I was with this French family, and I started going to school there and everything. Um, the Langlois have been recognized as uh, Hasidea, I will not, you know. Uh, Righteous uh, Gentiles? What they did. At Yad Vashem, yes. they've been recognized. Sorry, what? They've been recognized as Righteous Hasidea Matalam. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And did, did, the medal and <laughs> did you, did they take you to church? Did you have to go to church with them? Okay. You have to understand something about the French population in, in those days. Uh, they were very much on the left wing of, uh, of the French political spectrum. Okay, they were not churchgoers. 
Okay, so they took maybe once or twice to church just to see what it was like kind of thing. <laughs> and also, one is very funny, they took them to church once on Easter. It was the practice at Easter to give out in church what they called um, Galette de Pâques, which means Easter, Easter flatbread. So they took to eat this, I mean, it was matzah, they were baking matzah to show the connection between Easter and Passover, so I, this, this uh, piece of matzah, anyway. Here's a picture of Leon with Suzanne, who was his foster mother, one picture with Leon and his father and Suzanne, and one picture of Leon and his mother with Suzanne when they, okay, when she came to Nice to pick him up. This is absolutely incredible that we have these pictures. Oh yes. Oh, this with your father. <clears throat> but you know, amazing. I have all this on an electronic. It's okay, no, Daddy. Leon, this he is doesn't very want, good. He doesn't this want, is he no, Leon, this he is amazing. The video. It's different. Leon, and what what memories do you have of uh, being with this non-Jewish family? Oh, they were very kind to me, very good. It was, I started going to school. Did they have their own children? Or did, were there other children? In Not in the house where I was, no, because uh, there was uh, the head of household and they just had three daughters and a son who were not married. Um, and uh, so I started going to school, in the French country school. and. Um, I would observe. Wow. <laughs> That's Leon with his arms crossed. Yeah, this is him. Right there. Right in the middle. Well, if we can lift it a little bit higher. Wow. And is this in the school? Yeah. Yes, there's, there's the date there, 1943. 1943. And you are you were there with your arms crossed. Yeah. Wow. And did any of the other school children know that you were Jewish or that you were hidden? No. They they said that uh, in French c'est un petit Parisien. He's a little boy from Paris. Because there were a lot of French families who would send their children to stay in the countryside where there was more, enough to eat. Okay, okay, so that was it. But they knew that there was a, because my aunt and uncle were, had, were residing there, so they knew that I was a nephew of Monsieur Spira, the Spira, you know, Spira. And uh, so there were, but uh, nobody. And you never felt any anti-Jewish feeling or they didn't know that you were Jewish? No, well, I knew that I was Jewish, but I didn't, there was no anti-Jewish. But did the school children, did like they that. know that you... Or sometimes somebody, like, even in the, the, this family that kept me, Langlois, they were, uh, they were obviously not anti-Semitic. But if I said something smart, the boy, uh, Marcel, would say, Oh, ce petit Yupin, this little Yid, you know, wow. <laughs> he's so smart. <laughs> and... Leon, why did they decide to do it? Because it was very dangerous. If they would have been caught, um, yes. the consequences were, they did were, were terrible. They could have been killed. It was called Akaratatov, you know, the, the goodness of heart, really. They felt it was the proper thing to do, to, uh, to help out. And, uh, well, they were also anti-Nazi. Yes, they were obviously not at all in favor of Pétain. They were against the Pétain government and eventually one of their sons, Marcel, became a leader of the local resistance, the underground. Um, so, But it wasn't because of the, their religious convictions? No, or? nothing to do with it. They were quite, they were in the, you might call the anti-clerical mm -hmm. tradition of France, which France was quite anti-clerical. just righteous, good people. It was it, just the thing they to did do. The right it was thing. A humanity. But right? under enormous, enormous consequences if they would have been caught. Also, uh, I remember seeing in a history of, uh, of the resistance in that area, Suzanne was doing resistance work as well with 
with uh, on the side. We didn't know about this until we received a book maybe 10 years ago. Uh, with the history in that area, apparently she was doing things with documents. Well, I don't know. I don't remember that. I'd have, no, I'd, what happened was upstairs. that, okay, as, as they started, resistance units, like partisans, they were not called partisans in France, called resistants. Uh, then the Allies sent arms by parachute, and some of the fields, the, some of the parachute drops took place in their field, okay? And then the arms were hidden in the attic and eventually given out and uh, one of their sons, Marcel, became one of the leaders of the local resistance. He left the house and they found a camp in a forest somewhere. Uh, and they would, uh, you know, attack the Germans, uh, things like that. And you know, I can ask, what, ha what happened to your parents? Where were they in okay. hiding? Uh, we went to Nice, okay? And then when the Allies landed in North Africa, the Germans invaded the southern part of France, but not 100%. There was a strip of territory along the uh, Italian borders, including Nice, that was occupied by the Italian army for some historical reason. And But the Italians did not do anything against the Jews. They really, they did not, in fact, they were in charge and in fact they prevented the French police from <laughs> rounding up Jews. But then eventually in 1943, when the Allies landed in Italy, the Italian army, they just said, finita la guerra, andiamo a casa, okay, we, it was over, we're going, and they just left Nice. And what happened, the Germans came. And some of my friends, from my parents' friends were captured by the Germans. So my parents realized that this was no longer safe to stay in Nice and they went to a much larger city in France called Lyon. And there they essentially were in hiding in Lyon. My uh, father stayed in the house and my mother, who knew French much better, would go out and buy, you know, groceries and things like that. And they would send me letters that at first, you know, that the Langlois would read to me and then once I started learning to write, I would send them short letters and drawings of what I saw around me, horses and cows and things like that. And who took your parents in? Do you know the name of the family or...? No, they, they just found, they found an apartment in Lyon where they stayed there. And my mother would, could know French much better than my father, would go out to buy groceries and things like that. But my father stayed inside. And Not only that, your mother had, your mother had, uh, she was an only child, and her father gave her a very good education. So she spoke Polish the way a, a natural a, a Polish woman would speak. And she also knew German. She had uh, studied German in, in, in the Lycée, in her high school. So she could pass, she had false papers, she could pass for a Polish foreign worker. So it was possible for her to go out on the street with, with the false papers and pass as, uh, because the Germans were importing wor workers from Eastern Europe from Poland, from Czechoslovakia, from all the countries. So that was how she did it. Leon's father, who could not pass ever, uh, just stayed in hiding in, a, in an apartment. Yes. Did, apartment. What did, he, did he ever tell you what he did during the day? He just was sat there. <laughs> My mother went out and wow. I mean, they had bought money from Paris and they were using up whatever money they needed to go buy groceries and things like that. And none of the neighbors became suspicious that there was... Well, they said that after, after, after the liberation, some people came to see them and said, we knew you were Jewish, we knew you were Jewish, but we didn't say anything. So nobody, nobody turned them in. Which is a big thing. Because, yes, uh, yes. I think you got, you were rewarded with extra food rations and, mm -hmm. and a lot of food people actually did turn Jews in for... Yes, that's right. There's so a great story that you're about the liberation when the American soldier came 
remember your mother sent your father out to get a chicken? And she invited, she, they wanted to invite this guy for dinner. Oh, yeah, what happened, okay, when the Americans came, the, the Jewish men got out on the street and looked for Jewish American, American Jewish soldiers to bring them home for a Friday night dinner, okay? So my father, who knew, he had gone to the States before the war and he knew mass mattering of English, okay? He had spent maybe three months in New York. And so he brought this um, this American soldier, who was a Jewish American soldier, and uh, my mother said, my father, he was a very tall, big guy, I said, I kind of hinder, I only have a little chicken. And he understood, so, I have a big guy, I don't have a Translate? Well, you understand. Yeah. No, but if you can translate, yeah. I'll listen. Oh, okay. I, I'm big, but I don't eat a lot. <laughs> wow. And Leon, when did you first see your parents? Did they, during when the war was, was happening, did they ever come, did your mother okay. ever come and visit okay. you? My mother wanted to know what's going on with me, so she came once to, to see me, make sure that I was all right, like, you know, so... She, and do you remember that reunion? Do you remember seeing yes, her? Yes, yes. It was... My, my, the people knew that she was coming. They wanted to make it a surprise, so they said they would say, "Go to the front door and see what uh, if anyone saw." So then saw my mother, <laughs> so of course, and she stayed there a few days. It so. must have been very emotional when you see your mother. Well, yes, it was, you know, but she had to go back to to Lyon. And, and I th did you understand what was going on? Oh yes, of course. I knew that... Uh, but you were so young, you were at this age, you were... First of all, the family that kept me was very much against Pétain, against Vichy, okay? So first of all, they would listen to Radio Londres, the uh, French broadcast, free French broadcast from Radio Londres, Paris, and um, uh, one of their sons, Marcel, became one of the leaders of the local underground. And of course, on their fields, there were parachute drops of weapons, mm. wow. and some of the weapons were hidden in the house and in, uh, in the attic. Th where you were staying? Yes. In the same, that was, that and, was also very guns. dangerous. Hmm? And guns. But that's why I said weapons. Okay, no, weapons. sorry, I, wow. I was thinking of something. Else. And um, so. And Leon, w w were they very loving towards you? What do you mean? Were they loving? Were they very... Oh, uh, yes, they were very kind to me. Oh, sure, there was, especially the the daughters, one of their daughters who had come to get me in Nice, uh, Suzanne, she was like a second mother to me, okay? She made sure that I was well fed, that I behaved properly, that she was happy to see me learn in school, and because I started school, uh, then the French country school. And uh, could you bring any friends home with you, or...? Any of the, the school children, could they come home with you or would you no, go visit would their walk, homes? We would walk, walk back from school back to the, the village um, and um, that, that was it. I mean, I had friends, I, had, I would play with friends, from the, they were French friends, I would play with them and uh, that was it. I started going to school, you know, one room, country, country school. Whether we were in both kids from ages six to twelve, so one row for each age, <laughs> okay. and um, that uh, was it. I was very interested to see uh, the farm work. It was very hard. There were no tractors or anything. They used horses to cultivate the field. Also, the the uh, the family they made wooden shoes you know, something, and so I started wearing wooden shoes. <laughs> that, that was it. And when the liberation came, what do you recall, do you remember what happened when the war ended? Well, liberation, yes, first, uh, well, the, the um, um, Yes, our, our areas was liberated by the U.S. Army, okay, uh, and um, 
So of course there was great rejoicing, uh, especially for people of the underground, there were uh, like uh, parades and uh, you know, the, there, was, there was like a big celebration of, of the liberation and then my parents also eventually, Lyon was liberated so they could come and be reunited with me. But we didn't go back to Paris right away. Okay, so I just want to ask you, when your parents came to to take you back, to reclaim you in a way, yes. how was that reunion when you saw your father? Because you hadn't seen your father for... Two, two years, yes. It must have been incredibly emotional seeing your father as well. It was emotional, yes, but uh, I was happy to see them. But, you know, I can't say that uh, it was really anything special. I mean, I was happy to see them. Did you develop a close bond with your parents after being separated for so long? Yes, I knew they were my parents. I mean, yes, they were, yes, I, <laughs> I don't know, close bond, but I was with my parents and that was it. And so we stayed in that village uh, until March of 1945. Because my, my father went back to Paris to see what is the situation. Our apartment had been taken over by a French man who was running a, a leather good business. And uh, we had to... It, this happened to many Jewish families. Their apartments were taken over by French people. And... Um, you had to start legal proceedings to get your apartment back. But our apartment had been taken out <coughs> excuse me, by somebody who was making leather goods of some like like uh, wallets and things like that. So he claimed that if he had to give the apartment back, he said like 20 French workers would lose their job. So there was a kind of a settlement whereby we used one half the apartment and used a service entrance and the leather good workers used the other half using the main entrance. But eventually my father found another apartment, same building, so we could move there and have a whole apartment to ourselves. <laughs> and Leon, what happened to the remainder of your, your parents' families? Unfortunately, they were all... No one survived. Uh, those who had emigrated to France survived. Uh, Leon's grandfather, uh, they were from, uh, said Ravoroska, and I'm sure in Israel you've seen these memorial yeah, books. These are the memorial books. Yeah, this is the, they, they, the one from Ravoroska has been translated, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Oh, these are the memorial uh, books. Leon's grandfather was the uh, he was he was he was somebody he was a maher he was the head of the furriers guild in Ravaruzga that's all in there and he sent his children out one by one by one to France his eldest daughter stayed because she did not want to she and her husband did not want to leave the family. Well, Nahama was the eldest, or? Yeah, Chuma, yes, yes. Okay, Chuma was the eldest. Their youngest daughter was widowed very young, in an basically an industrial accident. And she had a one-year-old, and they did not want to leave. Uh, they didn't want to leave her. So Leon's father had Shlomi, Michael, and, and, oh, your aunt, of course. Bert, yeah, Bert, Bert she had gone Bela. to. Bela. Yeah, Schleimi, Michael, Bela, and Leon's father were out. All of them, thank God, survived with their children. Anybody who was married and had children, they all survived. Um, uh, Choma and her husband, and uh, who what was the youngest daughter? Rochel. Rochel. Uh, and her daughter did not survive. And uh, are you familiar with the French priest who has gone through Eastern Europe? 
Uh, he was and it's the boys. You know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the place he started was Bravaruska, and uh, we've never had a chance to actually meet him. Uh, when the last time we were in Paris, uh, you couldn't even visit his organization for security reasons; it was locked down. Um, he, he started off his research in Bravaruska. And uh, what we know is that they, it was the Holocaust by bullets. They were, they were, they were killed. Either that or deported to Berzich. And we don't know. We have no idea what happened. So, just, yeah, it was. And your, your parents, did they stay many years in France? Yes, after they, after they collected me, we went back to Paris, and uh, you know we just lived in Paris, and we uh, stayed there until 1954. That's when we emigrated to Canada. And living in Paris for your parents, it must have also been hard because there were many that were deported, also from. Yes, I mean we. You know, my father did the best he could to support his family. He was a furrier, um, and he did various kinds of business. He <laughs> because he had gone to the States for just maybe three months before the war, he had picked up a bit of English. So he would uh, somehow do business with the U.S. soldiers. <laughs> you see, the U.S. soldiers uh, there was a demand for U.S. dollars, okay, because it is a strong currency. So my father would buy U.S. dollars from the U.S. soldiers at a better rate than they could get from the U.S. Army Bank. <clears throat> then they could, the soldiers could use these dollars to do whatever soldiers do when, uh, you know, <laughs> they're on, on leave. There aren't any pictures of that in here. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, then there was a demand for U.S. dollars in the black market because mm. the French currency kept being devalued. And so people wanted to put their money in, in hard currency. So that's what he did. This was, of course, against the law. And he had a few brushes mm -hmm. with the police. But uh, fortunately, I mean, you know, he didn't end up in jail or anything like that. And coming to Canada, did somebody sponsor or they managed yes, to... Yes, because um, my aunt had, uh, no, my uncle, I think, sorry, my uncle had cousins who were living in Winnipeg, and somehow they sponsored them to come to Winnipeg. And then from Winnipeg to Montreal, and eventually my uncle, the, they sponsored us to come to live to, in Montreal. That's where, well, that's what we did. And you, you grew up in Montreal afterwards? Well, I was, by then I was, uh, I was a teenager. I had almost finished high school. So I've, I had took my last year of high school in a French Catholic high school in Montreal. And then uh, after that I started engineering at, uh, at McGill. So and can I ask, did your parents, did they associate with Holocaust survivors in Montreal? Yes, people from there, like Galiziano, okay, people from their, their area, like uh, and there was there was an organization called uh, Friends of France and Belgium. They were like French-speaking Jews who got together in a you know in a group in a social social group, and that's uh, how they had friends. And uh, Leon, I just want to ask: when you were growing up, could you speak about your experiences with your friends? Were they? Did you ever do that? Did you ever? open up or speak about what had happened to you? Well, okay, when, um, not really, I mean, when I started high school, I had a number of Jewish friends in high school, so we had our, you know, compared our, our memories, like, you know, because I also had been in hiding. Uh, and so, yes, I would talk about it. And. If I could ask you, what was your very first recollections of that you remember? The very first thing that you remember as a child. My first 
recollections. Recollection. I remember as a child. Um, well, interestingly enough, seeing German soldiers on the street in Paris. You remember that? Yes, yes. Seeing German soldiers on the street in Paris. And um, they were very, uh, very well dressed and very... And how old were you at this time? <sighs> See, that would have been... 1941, I was, I mean, four years old, four years old. And were you frightened? No, they, because they, they stayed in a hotel that was very close to where we lived, okay? Uh, and they would, we would see them on the street, and that's it. They, and of course, they would go out in bars and restaurants and with women and things like that. <laughs> And then did your family, were they always traditional, your parents, were they, were they religious? Okay, they were not religious or being a sense of religious. I mean, okay, we observed uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Shabbat, would your mother no, light candles? No. Yes, she would lit, light candles Friday night, but, uh, you know, we would drive on Shabbat. Uh, and as we attended, uh, we had a synagogue uh, in our district called Synagogue Rashi. Uh, and we would go there mostly for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, but, uh, that's about it. Um, it's still there. It's the synagogue is still there. And yes. when we when we go to Paris, that's where we daven. Where Leon had his bar mitzvah. And you daven in the same... Yes. I sit where his mother used to sit. That's amazing, sure. <laughs> and have you ever been to, to the town? Eastern Europe, Ravarska, no. And you wouldn't go into, into Poland? Have you ever been? No, I, I really... I once asked my father, would you like to go back? He said, no, there are no Jews left. Oh, yeah. I've been for work when I was with the Canadian Jewish News. I, uh, I went to Poland with a, a mission. And uh, I can see why Leon would not want to go. Yeah. It was very, very difficult. Our son... Our older son, middle child, uh, also went to Poland for a work assignment for IBM and uh, found it extremely emotionally moving. He was in Lublin for two, two months uh, working for the Lublin government. It was a, a, something with IBM. But at that time he went to Krakow, he went to uh, the camps. And he went to Medanik, which is... Yes, he went to Medanik, yeah. It's one of the suburbs of, of Lublin. But I, you know, it's, it's not something that... And Ravodowska is nothing now. It's a, it's a border post. And when did you become m much more observant of from? You became, you became the president of the Bight here in, in Toronto? <laughs> it's all her fault. Wow. Graduate school. Uh, we went, we be, oh, oh. You should tell late. that you're a convert. It's all right. Hmm? Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, I'm a convert. Uh, but uh, we, we married in Montreal, and after a year, Leon went back. He had an engineering degree, but he wanted to go into, um, uh, to more management. You know, he didn't want to be refining oil for the next <laughs> 40 years. So he went back to graduate school in the States uh, for something called operations research. And uh, when we were in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, I also ended up working full-time on campus and going to, graduate, going to courses half-time was something you could do there. They were very, very, I had a very good boss, very generous, and you got your tuition 50% off. And we started uh, just hanging around with the Hillel crowd. And had you converted at this time? Uh, yes, but it wasn't a formal Orthodox conversion. Um, and uh, yeah, we had, uh, we found a rabbi in Montreal who would marry us. But I was never really happy with it. It wasn't, it wasn't the real thing. So I have to ask you, Patricia, what made you want to convert? 
when we were talking about getting married, um, Leon said, I don't care whether you convert or not. I was a lapsed Anglican. Yes. Um, didn't, you know, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't keep it, didn't do, do anything. Um, he said, I don't, I, you don't have to convert, but I, I want my children to know that their father is Jewish. And I thought about it for a while, and I said, that's not going to be enough, because I knew what had happened. I had, uh, a lot of the information was just starting to come out. There were films, there were documentaries, and I learned, he, Leon had talked to me about his life and what had happened, and I thought, that's not enough. That's not going to be enough. So I thought, if, if their father's Jewish, their mother's going to be Jewish, too. That's, that's basically what happened. I wasn't observant. I ended up marrying a Robertson. <laughs> but your your parents they accepted you very well. Your parents. Um, it, it, that's a bit complicated. My mother died when I was a child, and uh, actually, it was my my father wasn't happy, but my stepmother was very supportive, and so that that helped a lot and at the end of his life after my stepmother had also passed away and my father was was in terminal heart failure he spent the last six seven months of his life living with us Amazing. in this house and they were at all the bar mitzvahs. Wow, really? Wow, that's wonderful. Bat and bar mitzvahs. They were. Uh, they. My dad gave at our younger son's bar mitzvah. He gave the best speech of all. <laughs> and uh, my. Uh, I have a half sister from my stepmother. Um, they're in Victoria now, but they were. We went back and forth all the time. You know. And, and Leon, your parents, they were supportive when, when you met uh, Patricia, they... Well, they were sort of. con concerned, okay, <laughs> at the but time, they but, they but uh, <clears throat> you know, eventually we, it well, all it worked, worked out. It worked, it and worked. We, and then Patricia, then did you go more for orthodox conversion? Uh, yes, and uh, that's a story which is not to be told okay. now. Okay, all right. It was it was but, complicated. But it, you but you you managed and yeah, it's it, it's it was complicated, but wow. it's okay. And uh, but we, look when, when we came when we came back to Toronto, uh, we were very very uh, it, things worked out very well. We were looking for an Orthodox community. Didn't really find one. I was teaching at the time high school met a couple of Orthodox teachers, uh, one of whom was the, uh, her father was the Mashkiach, where I got my meat. So we just sort of got drawn in. We found um, a neighborhood that was just opening up to young couples and wanted to start, really, it was a chavra. And uh, we were maybe at one point 50, 60 families at most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the originals, we were maybe 20 when we started. We all had our babies together. We, we, uh, you know, on Shabbos there'd be a line of wow. strollers. It was out in, out east in Toronto. It never took off. They thought the community would move east. It didn't. But eventually, we all moved here when this development opened up, and uh, we're we're still friends with people we met. When uh, we were, you know, when we were, when the kids were babies. That is really We've been to, and you know, we've been to baby namings, <laughs> bat mitzvahs, bar mitzvahs, weddings, but unfortunately the, some funerals. The bayat is legendary for its warmth and its inclusiveness yeah. and, mm -hmm. and it's just amazing. Everybody knows about the bayat. And to be the president, and it's it's it's, it's really I it's wonderful. I was a president for five. <laughs> well, <clears throat> so um, I just want to ask you, ask you both, what message do you impart to the future generations? 
if somebody had to ask you what you've been through and what message would you impart? Or what message do you give to your grandchildren? Do everything you can to remain Jewish and uh, maintain traditions. And, uh, uh, but keep an open mind to the outside world. And uh, how could I say? Just maintain your traditions, but do not be walled in. Okay, maintain traditions with an open mind. Mm -hmm. And Patricia, what what message would you? Uh, well, I think I would, obviously, with my history, I would reinforce Leon's message of tolerance. Uh, and respect for others. Uh, the way my family respected my choices and actually rejoiced in them. Um, they, 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 they just loved, my father and stepmother loved being with our kids and celebrating with them. And also uh, we have, we are still in contact with the family in in uh, in France. That's that that really that endangered their lives and the lives of their family to save you. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. took yes. our children back to meet them in oh in 1987. They were 17, 14, just past bar mitzvah, and 12. Um, when we went back for the ceremony for of the Righteous of the Nations, our middle son came with us and brought his two eldest children, his daughters. And this was held at Yad Vashem? No, it was held in France. Uh, in, in France. In, 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 uh, in, mm. in Nerey and Chateau Mayen. But they brought... So we were, there, we were there with our son and our two, our two granddaughters, who were our two oldest grandchildren. Uh, so uh, we're still in touch with them. The last time we were there, our daughter was with us. Wonderful. And they're the great granddaughter of the family that took Leon in came to do a, a North American trip with a friend of hers that and stayed amazing. with our daughter in her condo in downtown Toronto. That is, that is magnificent. Wow. So, we have kept up that, that connection. These are Patricia's parents, her mother and her father. Are they Patricia's parents? Wow. My father was in the, an officer in the Canadian Army in the Second World War. And can I ask, the, the family that saved you, have they planted a tree in the Avenue of the Righteous in Jerusalem at Yad Vashem? The best, we haven't seen it, but to the best of our knowledge, yes. yes. And their names are also in the, um, there is a, a part in, um, in Paris of, uh, what is it, where all the, where the famous people are entombed? Oh, the, uh, Père Lachaise? No, no, not Père Lachaise, it's the, it's the tomb where we, the, the, we went there the last time we were there. We'd never been where there are all these famous people who are basically it's a crypt and there is the um the Foucault's pendulum in the middle in the and they named there no, there's no. there's a Pont, wall in there called Pont Pantheon. there's a place the, called the Pantheon oh wow the then. Pantheon and they uh, they memorialize great figures in French history I think Victor Hugo is there uh you know people people who are very, very famous. And there is a wall of, uh, their, of, of righteous among the nations, and their name is there. And Patricia, in the book, is there a picture of the family? Of the, uh, the, the entire family in Neve? Or, or that, that same Leon? Yes. Yes. Okay, I'll find it. There are several. And in the meantime, I just want to Thank you both. Um, Leon and Patricia, I just want to thank you, Leon. It's been 
a great honor and a privilege and Patricia I am so grateful to you as well it's it's really it's it's been exceptionally special hearing your story so what are you looking for Patricia? I'm looking for a picture of the family itself yes. yeah well I think I can find it faster. okay faster the, the message that you've given in Leon Leon... Can I get you something? No, to no, I just want to mention that it's so important because the family that, that really risked their lives to save you, Leon, that's what they embody. The mm -hmm. Tolerance and respect and they're, and they're, the goodness. They're, to they're, they're, they're yeah, really, some people said, why did they do it? For political reasons or for money or something? I said, no, just... You know. This and the goodness of the heart. This is how I started, yeah. started school. <laughs> but I want to thank you both so very much, and you should just have Nachlis and Admevestrim in good health. This is me with my cousin and my two cousins. The Spiras. They had oh, so I'll, I'll show this to the... This book is incredible. It's, it's These were your two... And you in the middle. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so if yeah, you could cool. just find a picture of the... This very righteous family that... Yes, just a second. Yeah, that's the house. Oh, where yeah. I stayed. This is the house where you were hidden. Yes. Yeah. It's still there. It's been renovated, but it's still there. And when you go and visit, is it, very, it must be very emotional to go back, to think... Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, well, Suzanne is no longer with us. Her younger sister is no longer with us. The, the youngest sister, uh, Giselle, is now in an uh, uh, a old, old people's home. Well, there's a wedding picture. Yeah, there's one of their sons. Oh, but son. then it would have a picture of the family. A lot of them. A lot of them. Oh, so can we show it? You see, what, when there's a wedding, the whole village gets invited. <laughs> They're all related. So anyway, this is when the, the have, daughter, yeah, Suzanne, came to get me in Nice. Yeah, I think we have that. Patricia, could you show the picture of the wedding? This is yes. very special. Uh, here we are. Ah, uh, yes. And this is Marcel's wedding after he was the one who was an officer in the resistance. And does it does it say the year that it was that it was uh, the wedding that he was married? Uh, it would have been 1945. Yes. And were you at the wedding? No, no, I was in Paris. Magnificent. Yeah. Yeah, they're. Yeah, they're. Uh, I remember the first time I met them. 